This is a Trident Disabilities audio archive recording, The Emancipatory Visions of a Sex Magician. Pascal Beverly Randolph's Occult Politics by Lara Langer Cohen, read by a Trident Volunteer. Erotic magic, black emancipation, gender fluidity, interplanetary spirit realms, these were but a few of the topics that preoccupied Pascal Beverly Randolph, born 1825, and a cult thinker who believed that his multiracial identity of afforded him peculiar mental power and marvelous versatility. Laura Langer Cohen considers the neglected politics of Randolph's esoteric writings alongside the repeated frustration of his activism, how dreams of other worlds above and below our own reflect the unfulfilled promises of emancipation. Next is a photograph of Pascal Beverly Randolph taken by Rodney Poole of Nashville, Tennessee in 1874, and then includes a man with slicked back hair, a long beard, wide eyes, and he's wearing a suit and tie. Born in Five Points, Manhattan to a black mother and a white father who left soon after his birth, Pascal Beverly Randolph, born 1825, died 1875, grew up in a poverty that deepened after his mother died of cholera when he was six. After a difficult, itinerant childhood, he recounts working on ships sailing between New England, Cuba, and Britain before beginning to lecture on spiritualism and perform as a trans medium. In 1858, however, he publicly broke with the spiritualists, citing their racism, the hypocrisy of their radicalism, and their narrow view of the immaterial world. In a series of lectures, he attacked the characters of leading spiritualists, ridiculed their trances as jugglery, or worse, demon possession, dismissed their business of world bettering as hypocrisy and railed against some of their central tenets such as the belief popularized by andrew jackson davis that only select souls are immortal and thus that all spirits are good he concludes his crimes are rete mucosmal residing in the color of his skin randolph relates that after a harrowing suicide attempt or as he explained it elsewhere a transformative experience with egyptian hashish he finally left spiritualism behind while Western occultists balked at a tawny student of esoterics like Randolph, they often invested their knowledge with power by racializing it, attributing its secrets to Oriental, Chaldaic, Persian, Egyptian, Asiatic, or Arab sources. Randolph trafficked in this manufactured exorcism too, but also developed a philosophy and politically complicated theory of the occult anchored in his own racialized identity. I owe my successes, mental, to my conglomerate blood, my troubles and poverty to the same source. He spent two of his most productive writing years in Louisiana, where he encountered the area's rich African di diasporic religious life. Although in one of his lectures he boasts of exposing a whole tribe of Vodo in New Orleans, he also concedes it was from one of the Vodo queens that I gained much of my knowledge, and elsewhere he cites hoodoo and obeah practices and flaunts the secrets he learned from the quadroons of Louisiana. His self-identification as a saying melee, Randolph's curiously feminized form of the colonial intellectual Moreau de St. Mary's term for people with the smallest fraction of African ancestry, afforded him peculiar mental power and almost marvelous versatility. Because he already channeled multiple racial identities within his body, Randolph reasoned he was predisposed to channel other identities, not of this world. Although at times Randolph insisted that not a drop of continental African or pure black blood runs through me, over the course of his life he increasingly identified with the struggles of black people. When the Civil War began, he recruited black troops for the Union Army, and during Reconstruction, he worked as a teacher and agent for Freedmen's Bureau schools in Louisiana, participated in important black and Republican conventions, and served as a correspondent for the weekly Anglo-African. But from within these established institutions, Randolph was also developing a subterranean praxis that he called angular and eccentric, in which L. H. Stallings described as that of a funky black freak. He founded a series of secret societies organized around his idiosyncratic interpretation of Rosicrucianism, an esoteric religious movement claiming to preserve the wisdom of a mysterious ancient order, and he dreamed of building still more. Randolph produced a huge body of writing, which he mostly self-published with his first wife, Mary Jane Randolph, and his second wife, Kate Corson Randolph, both spiritually gifted practitioners in their own right.
Handbooks, pamphlets, novels, newspaper articles, manifestos, historiography, a wildly embellished memoir, printed private letters, handwritten manuscripts, and more. He taught curious students a kind of DIY occult practice that they used on their own bodies, through study, sex, and drugs, to make connections with the spiritual world. But the gospel of a hallucinatory cosmic sex magic was not an easy path for anyone in the late 19th century, much less a black man. Randolph struggled against racism, which he deeply internalized, economic precarity, and an abiding sense of being an outsider his entire life. Even when it came to his own theories, he seemed to have vacillated between belief and doubt. In 1875, he shot himself in the head at age 49. Below this is a picture with a brown background and gold drawings all over it. On the bottom is the pyramids with the with an Egyptian statue and a man riding a camel pointing at the sky, which includes a large eye with lines pointing down towards a globe with wings on it and a death symbol. The description for this photo includes Pascal Beverly Randolph's personal motto, Try, accompanying his often reproduced emblem featuring a winged globe representing the soul above an ancient Egyptian landscape from the cover of Ulysses, The History of Love, 1874. Yet in a turn of events that fulfilled some of Randolph's greatest ambitions, after death his work helped to bring about an effervescent of the ni- late 19th century and early 20th century transnational occultism. Better remembered occult groups like the Theosophical Society, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, and the Hermetic Society of the Golden Dawn, formed in the late 1870s and 1880s and drew heavily on Randolph's thought. The American Rosicrucian R.S. Clymer heralded Randolph and his order's founder, although his accounts greatly simplified and regularized Randolph's beliefs. Clymer's philosophical publishing company, the California Esoteric Publisher, Health Research, and other occult and New Age publishing companies in the United States, South America, and Europe continued to reprint Randolph's writings throughout the 20th century. Cosmic Undergrounds The details of Randolph's cosmology change from work to work, but they might be summed up by Fred Moten's statement, Fuck a home in this world if you think you have one. He has generally believed that all beings begin as monads, thoughts of God, that scatter over the universe like a kind of divine particulate. Some remain immaterial and some reach worlds, including Earth, where they are embedded in rocks beneath its surface. Over a long period, they materialize in a succession of geological plant and animal forms, and finally become human souls, a trajectory leading from extraterrestrial worlds in the underground to human beings. After death, the souls travel to a vast and heterogeneous system of spiritual realms, some located on belts around the planets, some in a zone that encircles all the galaxies and others still beyond them, and arrive at a location corresponding to their spiritual development. These souls may be stuck where they land, or they may continue the process of spiritual development and move throughout the middle states of the spirit world to reach an unimaginably radiant soul world. Randolph's criteria for these celestial divisions varied over the course of his career. At times, he delineates them in starkly racist terms, asserting that souls of African, Native American, and some Asian people inhabit the lower realms and stand little chance of leaving them. At other times, sometimes within the same text, he describes the dissolution of earthly categories in the afterlife. Ties, blood, race, or family count for little or nothing over there, he writes in After Death or a Disembodied Man, 1868. And in his late work, he declares that the choice abodes of spiritual land primarily belong to people of color. And below this is an excerpt that entails that there are all kinds of people and races around the world and some outnumber others by thousands, and also those same ones excel against the others in degree of mind, love, knowledge, force of character, and power of soul. Others may be even more superior and constitute the population of the heavens proper. In his description of the spirit realms, Randolph's racial thought oscillates excruciatingly between replicating the earthly categories that thwarted him and creating a world unto itself. In these latter instances, the spirit realms offer not only an exit from white supremacy, but an eternity of redress, which gathers people of color from all over the earth to enjoy dominion beyond it. Below this is an old photograph that is weary at the edges and hard to see, 
but includes a little float with wheels covered in flowers with five people on it, one standing on a pedestal above the others. The description for this is a photograph by George McEwiston of Juneteenth Celebrations in Corpus Christi, Texas, in 1913. Randolph pictured the spears, divisions, zones, and sections of the spirit world in elaborate detail, including their distinctive environments, architecture, and cultural institutions. The appearance of each sphere, he explains, corresponds to the spiritual development of its inhabitants, because they are a projection from the souls who dwell together and create their own scenery and surrounding. Randolph means this quite literally. In the spirit world, each thought possesses an inherent vitality of its own, as also form, pro proportion, and coherence. In short, spirit worlds are made of palpable ideas. As such, they contain both familiar forms of animal life and entirely different ones that embody some salient and positive love, principle, or affection. Human souls look like earthly people, but instead of blood, only a pure, white, or colorless electrical current courses through them. They wear clothes and have no bad teeth or saliva. They move through space using magnetism. They have buildings, cities, schools, art, music, and more fun than we do. They also have better sex, for up there and there only can its deep mysteries be fully known. Its keener joys can be felt. Souls do get married. These marriages do not depend on justice, parson, or priest, and they last just so long as the parties thereto are agreeable and mutually pleased with and attracted to each other, and no longer. Looking for language to describe the relation between our familiar world and the mysteries of the spirit realms, Randolph reached for the subterranean. Spe specifically, Randolph envisions the interplanetary spirit realm as the world's underground. Through occult study and practices, he promises one could cultivate the ability by self-effort or otherwise to drop beneath the floors of the other world and come up, as it were, upon the other side. Randolph used the phrase to drop beneath the floors of the outer world multiple times in his writings to describe practical occultism. His image of the spirit world's simultaneous proximity and exteriority to everyday life seems to have resonated with him. But he also uses the image of the underground to explain that the spirit world was interior, buried within a person's soul, because the abysses, labyrinths, and the most secret recesses of your being themselves hold a microscopism of the universe. To be clear, for Randolph, these subterranean regions of the soul are not a metaphor. They are an actual portal. Randolph charts their egress to unknown worlds in the first half of dealings with the dead. A human soul is migration and its transmigrations, which is narrated through the medium of Randolph by a disembodied soul named Cynthia Temple. After dying, Temple recounts how the soul principle within her rapidly sunk down into one of the profoundest labyrinths of its very own vast caverns. Following this is an excerpt which includes down down still lower and deeper into the awful abyss of itself it sank until at last it stood solitary and alone in one of its own secret halls. The outer realm with all its pains and joys, cares, sorrows, and ambitions, hopes, likes, antipathies, and aspirations, all its shadows and fitful gleams of light were left behind, and naught of the great wild world remained. Having descended into her own soul, Temple then finds herself in the soul world, an inconceivably beautiful place of heightened sensory experience where she joins her fellow spirits, including an ancient Egyptian king and Rosicrucian with an enviable name, Thoughtmore, who becomes her lover. This boundless realm of mysteries, as Randolph describes it elsewhere, reveals earthly existence to be simply the outer realm of unimaginably greater unguessed worlds. Sex Magic Collectives At the same time he was conceptualizing occultism in subterranean terms, Randolph was also working hard to build occultism into the underground movement. As he moved around the United States propelled by hardship and restlessness, he founded a series of secret societies devoted to his interpretation of Rosicrucianism the Supreme Grand Lodge of the Triple Order in San Francisco in 1861, the Rosicrucian Club in Boston in the late 1860s or early 1870s, the Brotherhood of Eulis in Nashville in 1874, and another incarnation of the Supreme Grand Lodge, now the Triplicate Order in San Francisco in late 1874. 
The precise relationships between these organizations remain unclear, but Randolph framed all of them as alternatives to the mainstream spiritualistic circles that mistreated him. Ostracized by those four, and with whom I have labored since 1848, met with an ingratitude at every step, I gladly accept the ostracism of the many for the good companionship of the few, he declared. Yet not so few after all, for day by day our brotherhood of thinkers has increased. Randolph's swelling brotherhood of thinkers was probably fantasy. None of the lodges seemed to have lasted more than a few months, and Randolph's biographer, John Patrick Devaney, wonders to what extent they exist at all. Below this is a charter for Randolph's triplicate order of Rosicrucia, Pythian, and Eulis, supposedly founded, founded in San Francisco in 1874. In addition to founding secret societies, Randolph sought to construct a virtual occult underground through a sub-Rosa body of writing, offered through mail order, that his more widely available publica publications hinted at but would could not themselves contain. In interpolated statements, footnotes, and publishers' advertisements, Randolph promoted a shadow repertoire. Pamphlets, privately printed letters, handwritten manuscripts, formulas, and correspondence di disclosing secrets that cannot well be printed in a book. Texts like The Golden Letter, The True Oriental Secret, and Seretic Mystery, The Mysteries of Eulis, and The Golden Secret showed readers how they could use their sexuality in combination with the good diet, drugs, namely hashish, devices like magnets and mirrors, mental concentration, and study to exercise their paranormal capacities. Randolph may have run his clandestine clandestine mail order business for profit, although the prices in most texts were so low, or in some cases non-existent, that this motive seems insufficient. It is also possible that Randolph created it in order to avoid scrutiny, particularly after New York passed a state law prohibiting the sale of obscene materials in 1868, which in turn prompted Anthony Comstock to lobby Congress successfully to outlaw the distribution distribution of obscene materials to the U.S. mail in 1873. The fact that Randolph was a black man writing about sex probably would have made him a particularly target of state authorities. The fact that he was a black man writing about how sex might revolutionize the globe could only have compounded his danger. Randolph may have also concluded that such subterranean writing offered the best way to reach the democratic underlayer of society, where he believed true sexual knowledge belonged, and to circumvent the media's dominance of the upper strata, whose newspapers by myriads spread gross and culpable non-knowledge about all the vital points that cluster around one word, sex. But beyond being instrumental, the relation between the underground circulation of Randolph's writings and their sex magic content seem reciprocal. Underground circulation heightens their occult capacity. Randolph often explicitly addresses his writing about sex to the personal needs of heterosexual married couples, but this address is at odds with the powers he ascribes to sexual activity, as well as with the capaciousness of his ideas about gender and sexuality. I believe in love, all the way through, he declared, and while I live, will help every man, woman, and the in-betweenies to win, obtain, intensify, deepen, purify, strengthen, and keep it and I will help all others do the same. There, that's me. I mean it. He deemed earthly gender identity as provisional, that is, limited to a given arc of the universal polygon of soul's durations, while God is both male and female in his account. Below this is a diagram from Magia Sexualis, 1931, translated by Maria de Nagloska, depicting one of the five positions a couple must assume during the operation of sexual magic for the prayer of love. Once thought of forgery, Magia Sexualis is now believed to be a complication of sub different works by Randolph interspersed with Maria de Nagloska's own theories. Accordingly, while Randolph taught both feminine and masculine occult practices, these correspond not to the practitioner's gender identity, but to the types of power they exercise. The entire universe he held was organized around male and female forces, but he saw earthly notions of physiological sex differences, differences as a ruse. It don't follow that all who wear the penis are in sole true males, or that a vagina is the sign of a womanness. Randolph's conception of what Benjamin Cahan calls misattuned bodies and souls 
leads Cahan to identify him as the first theorist of inversion, the late 19th century sexuological theory that explains same-sex desire as a matter of being, eternally one sex, but internally another. But I am less sure we can fold Randolph's ideas into the taxonomies of sexuality. His ideas about sex exceed inversion's binary model extending to the betweenies, mutability, and the possibility of holding multiple sex subjectives simultaneously in a single body. Moreover, his sweeping rejection of physiological sex differs markedly from sexology's attempts to reify it, stigmatizing perceived sexual ambiguity through a tendency to racialize it, as Siobhan Somerville observes. Randolph seems not to be thinking the emerging terms of modern sexuality so much as working out an erotic praxis that lies both in their shadow and on an entirely different plane. Randolph also departed from the most prominent sexual dissident movement of the day, free love, which by the late 19th century was dominated by individualist anarchists who saw sexual freedom as an expression of individual sovereignty. Instead, Randolph called back to an earlier incarnation of free love, the Fourierist utopian communities of the 1850s, where passional attraction organized new forms of erotic and social life. More specifically, Randolph's theory of sex amplified his theory of mediumship, which he believed did not involve yielding, yielding oneself the direction of a spirit, as most spiritualists supposed, but was instead a strange blending by which the medium could hold mixed identities in a single body. Both these theories in turn seem homologous to Randolph's belief that his position at what he called a composite man or racially mixed, especially qualified him for acts of supernatural communion. Sex offered the most expansive possibilities for such communion because soul power and sex power are coefficients and codependence. By cultivating their sexual capacities, practitioners could become connected to celestial forces and harness their power, knowledge, and energy. But this can happen only at the moment, the very instant of the holy, full, mutual, and pure orgasm or ejection of the three fluids and two auras or prostatic, seminal, and female lymph or lochia. Mutual orgasm, in other words, opens a momentary pathway to the cosmos, enabling humans to connect with spirits. Randolph's sex magic promises an array of earthly benefits, including heightened pleasure, physical health, guaranteed love, the empowerment of women, and the production of intellectually superior children. But in his subterranean public publications, he reveals that its real value goes beyond this. Churches and marriage exist as repressions, our system in expansion, he asserts in the Asaic mystery. Love forever against the world. Once adepts cultivate the Latin powers, he predicts they will revolutionize the globe, bidding farewell to the many mold, modes, moods, opinions, sentiments, thoughts, and procedures of current civilization and ushering in a new epoch of human history. Below this is a picture of a woman to the left, with a veil draped over her and snakes going up her body while she holds a wine glass. To the right of this is the title page and front piece of a 1930 reprint of Pascal Beverly's Randolph's Ulysses from 1874. Randolph's Black Revolutionary Prophecies Randolph's occultism is both totalizing and so out there that it can seem utterly disconnected from earthly events, yet his most prof prolific Writing years were also a period of intense political activism when he was recruiting black soldiers for the Union Army and helping found the National Equal Rights League, teaching in and advocating for Freedmen Borough School in Louisiana, participating in various colored conventions, and lecturing and writing in support of these endeavors. John Patrick Devaney describes the work as almost entirely removed from Randolph's usual occult concerns and other scholars have likewise tended to consider his occultism and political activism as separate tracks in his life. But references to anti-black violence and scenes of black liberation realize in his occult writing like its own attendant spirits. These moments invite us to consider the politics of Randolph's occultism, particularly in the light of the repeated frustration of his political activism and to read his dreams of upheaving the world and joining other worlds alongside the unfulfilled promises of emancipation. To get a sense of the connection between Randolph's occult undergrounds and his post-emancipation politics, consider the migration of a phrase that recurs through his writing, We may be happy yet. In Randolph's occult works, this is an expression of esoteric knowledge, 
It appears in the mouths of all spiritually gifted characters, and as the formula of the cult secret society, the mysterious brotherhood, and the wonderful world of Ravelet. He identifies it as his own motto in another novel, Tom Clark and His Wife, and uses it as the finale for the second part of Euless. But in between these works, Randolph reused the phrase in other contexts, the 1864 National Convention of Colored Man in Syracuse. The convention, which led to the founding of the National Equal Rights League, gathered a who's who of the leading black political voices in, of the era, including Frederick Douglass, who was elected president, Henry Highland Garnet, William Howard Day, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, J.W.C. Pennington, John Mercer Langston, William Wells Brown, Peter Clark, and Jermaine Logan. One wonders how the other delegates received Randolph. He had earned a reputation as a provocateur of anti-slavery meetings, often more concerned with proving his own angular and eccentric character than aiding the movement. Even as he wrote eloquently about his alienation from white people, he sometimes seemed actively to alienate himself from black people. At the same time, wrote room to the National Convention of Colored Men's resolution to promote everything that pertained to a Wells order and dignify life leave for a sex magician. Over the next five years, as the war ended, Reconstruction began and Randolph moved south to take part in it. He developed a new vision of revolutionary destiny for black people, after death or disembodied man, in 1868. His fullest account of the worlds of embodies unearthed peoples builds to a prophecy of wor world-shattering upheaval. The disembodied, unearthed people to whom Randolph refers are technically the spirits of the dead in the afterlife, but the adjective's peculiar negative construction, which implies something done to peoples, and the word peoples itself, with its connotations of groups rather than individual identity, also evoke the situation of black people in the afterlife of slavery. To borrow Sadia Hartman's phrase, an association reinforced by references to racial violence that thread through the book, Randolph wrote After Death while working for the Freedmen Bureau in Louisiana, where he first taught in New Orleans and then tried to build new schools in the countryside to the West, chronicling his experiences for the Anglo-African Weekly and the Religio-Philosophical Journal. The work was extremely dangerous. Randolph was in New Orleans on July 30, 1866, when a mob of armed white men, backed by the police, attacked a march of black and white radical Republicans and their supporters in what would be known as the New Orleans Massacre. If hell is any worse than New Orleans, I pity the damned, he informed the New York Tribune, and in the countryside it was little better. The writer Edmonia Goodell Highgate, who was teaching just 15 miles from Randolph, recounted that white supremacists shot at her and her students, and the rebels here threatened to burn down the school and house in which I board before the first month was passed. Below this is a cartoon drawing that includes a man in a crown, walking out behind a concrete door with bricks while there is a massacre going on outside where men are shooting at each other. The description for this is Thomas Nast, The Massacre at New Orleans, 1867. The political cartoon criticizes President Andrew Johnson dressed as a king for allowing the New Orleans Massacre of 1866 to unfold, wherein white rioters attacked a peaceful demonstration of black freedmen. Nearly 50 people were killed and almost 200 injured. While the politics of Randolph's other writing often remain below the surface, he explicitly frames After Death's idea in the context, in the context of his work for the Freedmen Bureaus and especially the experience of being terrorized by white supremacists. He explains that these circumstances shaped his conceptualization of the book. Below this is an expert that includes, For weeks together, I was obliged to sleep with pistols in my bed because the assassins were abroad and red-handed. Murder skulked and hovered around my door. Daily threats of summary strangling seasoned many of my meals. While writing out the first edition of this revelation, the offense being that, under the orders of my country's officers, I taught back some thousands of blacks, blacks and whites too, the sublime arts of reading and penmanship, and yet the work laid out was accomplished then finished now. Reminders of the book's condition of production pepper the text abruptly transporting the reader from the resplendent landscapes of the spirit world to the grim scenes of this one. I am at the writing of the first edition of this book here in the carpenter shop of Auguste Langry, Landry, 
in St. Martinsville, St. Martin's Parish, Louisiana, May 12, 1866. I am in this barn in St. Martinsville, pinning the lines now before the reader's eyes. These uncanny conduits between St. Martinsville and the soul realm suggest that Randolph's vision of life beyond the grave may reflect his efforts to imagine a line of flight out of this world. In the second half of After Death, Randolph takes his fantasy a step further, picturing not only an exit from this world, but the upheaving of it. The world upheaval is literal and terrestrial as well as social. He notes that in his 1863 historical, theological, geological study, Pre-Adamite Man, he had argued that the prehistoric world was rocked by a cataclysm in which the molten mass in the earth's bowels become, became disturbed and it vomited forth fire and flame from a hundred volcanic mounts. But since he wrote that book, he adds, which is also to say in the five years since the Emancipation and Proclamation, I have become convinced that we are liable to such a catastrophe occurring again at any moment. He predicts that soon a family of asteroids will strike the Earth, which will cause the northern pole to sink and the southern one to rise, tilting the planet dramatically on its axis. Terrific storms, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions will follow. Whole sections of the Earth will sink and again be thrown up, and the mountain and mountain ranges will be leveled. In this tumult, Earth's bowels will be completely outtuned, and gold, silver, precious stones, and metals will be thrown to the surface in quantities that will forever bar them as standards of value. Below this is a picture of volcanoes erupting and mountains being burst out with a river in between. The description is John Martin, the great day of his wrath, oil on canvas, from 1853. The painting is thought to have been inspired by Revelation 6. Following this is a picture with a border that says watch meeting and a picture of people debating and hovering over a podium all crammed together. The description for this one is 1863, Carte de Visit depicts the events of December 31st, 1862, the still celebrated watch night when enslaved and free African Americans gathered together, many in secret to ring in the new year and await news of the emancipation. Emancipation Proclamation had taken effect. Millenarian prophecies were not uncommon in the late 19th century, but after death is distinctive for the way it frames apocalypse, apocalypse with the author's experience of white supremacist violence. These incidents, along with Randolph's new conviction that we are liable to apocalypse, seem to tie the Earth's imminent upheaval to the, to the continuation of black unfreedmen after emancipation. Notably, the forthcoming cataclysm in the better world it ultimately, ultimately inaugurates coincides with literal emergence of the underground. When Randolph concludes the earth is gestation new and better children, fearful will be her part tuition, but joyous will we the family be. He imagines the earth's gestation as the quickening forces within it that will forge new com communities above it. We might read after death's vision of the earth turned inside out as also imagining Randolph's conception of the occult underground, contiguous with the extraterrestrial against the world in his words. Yet by the time Randolph issued a revised edition of After Death five years later, the vision of extraterrestrially induced seismic cataclysm had vanished. He rewrites the prophecy to predict and set a future of modified republicanism in the United States anchored in racial segregation. He asserts that Indians and the unfortunate mixed races are destined for extinction. White Americans will dictate laws to the habitable globe, but benignly, and the nation will give the blacks a vast territory freely. Before the end of 1875, there will come a literal and unprecedented outpouring of the spirit world, especially in the southern states among the blacks, who will, with the most frenzied zeal, march off to their Zion in the southwest. If I am in the body on that day, I will be their Peter the Hermit and cast my loss with theirs, Randall vowed. Below is an excerpt that says the new empire and the new civilization yet to come out of that poor yet rich and mighty people is destined to be as great in peace and spiritual goodness as their masters have been in intellect and war. In that new Zion, science will erect her halls and art shall build her schools and in them African genius untainted for the particular hue God's doing not theirs, shall pursue the triumphs of investigation, a, and by its warmth and fervor open new doors to mysterious realms,
above and around us, that the colder white can never penetrate, and thus the black shall add his quota to the common stock of human knowledge, and the word justice will have a meaning in this world. The apocalyptic fervor and subterranean upheaval of the 1867 edition have dropped out, replaced by the prospect of a spiritually developed black colony. We might see Randolph's faith in reconstruction in this vision, but it is hard not to hear despair in his prediction of white global rule, however peaceful. The eradication of indigenous and multiracial people and the relegation of black people to the desert to commune with the mysterious realms above and around us, concluding that the races can never live side by side on equal terms. Randolph looks toward a colonization project directed by the U.S. government that strongly resembles the effort of white-led American colonization society to send free African Americans to West Africa in the early 19th century. As the frontier replaces the underground, Randolph no longer contemplates destroying the world to remake it. He just wants it to be left in peace. In this attenuated future, justice will have a meaning in this world. Not when it is upturned, but once black people open new doors into other ones. This essay is excerpted and adapted from Laura Langer Cohen, Going Underground, Race, Space, and the Subterranean in the 19th Century United States, Durham and London, 2023. Copyright Duke University Press, 2022.